À l'ordre, s'il vous plaît, Madame la Secrétaire. Order, please, Madame Secretary. Thank you. Good morning with the presentation of Netflix. Please introduce yourself and you may begin. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman, Vice Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Corey Wright. I'm the Director of Global Public Policy for Netflix. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with our service, Netflix delivers movies and TV shows over the open Internet. We entered Canada in September 2010. Canada was our first international market beyond uh, the United States, and it's among our most successful markets globally. And we have Canadian consumers to thank for that. Netflix's business model is simple. We provide consumers a platform to discover amazing movies and TV shows, and we give them control over their television viewing experience. Our members can watch as much as they want to watch, when and where they want to watch it, and on virtually any Internet-connected device. At Netflix, we strive to avoid a lot of the hassles and headaches that people typically associate with pay TV services. We're available for one monthly low price, no commercials. Members get one free month to try out Netflix. There are no long-term commitments or contracts, and members can quit or rejoin at any time. We believe that this consumer-focused approach is what people want, and increasingly, it's what they expect. We think the CRTC is doing the right thing by asking Canadians to tell you what they want from their television services. And though some interveners seem to think that this proceeding is all about Netflix, it's not. It's about what Canadian consumers want, and thousands of Canadian consumers have responded to your invitation to share their views on the subject. So what do we think at Netflix that Canadian consumers want? Based on their responses, they want lower prices, they want more options, they want the flexibility to watch what they want to watch, when and where they want to watch it. They've embraced enthusiastically the Internet, online media, and increased choice and competition. You invited Netflix here today to talk about our view of the future of TV. And like other media before it, TV is going online. Broadcasting is a one-way, supply-driven medium. A fixed number of broadcasters control distribution channels. They determine what the public can watch, when they can watch it. Online media are different. They're interactive. They're demand-driven. An unlimited number of content providers are competing to offer a seemingly endless array of content over the open Internet. This shifts control to consumers. They can decide what they want to watch and when they want to watch it. We're moving from a period of broadcast scarcity to one of Internet abundance. This has a profound and largely positive impact on consumers and the marketplace for content. For consumers, the continued evolution of online streaming means more choice, diversity of content, and pricing options. Individuals and communities can find and enjoy diverse programming that is not usually offered by traditional broadcasters. Most traditional broadcasters are bound by a linear programming schedule, and they rely on advertising. It's a fine business model, but it often means that they have to put a premium on airing content that will appeal to the widest possible audience. Online video services like Netflix have some more freedom to offer niche content or experimental content. Our business doesn't depend on getting millions of people to watch a single show all at once at a predetermined time. Our business depends on our members consistently finding amazing content on our service and enjoying it whenever they want to. The technological transformation from scarcity to abundance has also lowered barriers to entry, allowing almost anyone to produce and distribute audiovisual content on a global basis. It means that not only high cost and high quality content can be successful, user generated content and even channels are, provided, are proving to be hugely popular. For content producers, this TV transformation means growing demand for content, both old and new, movies, documentaries, serial programs, music videos, and other audiovisual content. Not surprisingly, content, produ excuse me, content producers now focus on developing content for multiple platforms, leading to more revenue streams domestically and in international markets. All these Internet abundance-driven outcomes are made possible by the open Internet principle of non-discriminatory access known as net neutrality. Netflix itself is delivered and accessed over the open Internet. 
That means that the traffic management and usage-based billing practices of broadband access providers can impact both the quality and the cost of our service for end users. Carriers that control the local access network to the Internet have become vertically integrated with broadcasting and Internet content services. This increases their incentives to favor these affiliated services over unaffiliated and independent providers. Online businesses should succeed or fail on the quality of the content of the service that they offer to consumers, not because of special treatment from broadband providers. As such, the CRTC's Internet Traffic Management Practices Framework remains critical to ensuring that Canadian consumers, not broadband gatekeepers, pick winners and losers online. The online marketplace is fast-paced, it's highly competitive, and highly driven by consumer demand. The proliferation of Internet-delivered content is changing and also challenging all media to better respond to the needs and demands of consumers. Netflix's entry into Canada has helped drive innovation and consumer choice. Following Netflix's entry, BDUs have now launched their own over-the-top services, such as ShowMe and Illigo. While Netflix is at the forefront of this trend, it's not alone in offering high-quality streaming television online. Other online video services, as well as broadcasters, broadcast distributors, telephone companies, cable companies, as well as content aggregators and curators like newspapers, are quickly moving to the online audiovisual market. Most consumers use Netflix and these other online video services to supplement their viewing of traditional broadcasting services. And while traditional television providers are likely to remain the mainstay of Canadian diets in the near future, the trend toward more and better online video will continue. Next, I'd like to discuss how the online video market promotes Canadian culture. Canadian content is, of course, a key consideration in this proceeding. And based on the CRTC's examinations of new media, it appears that Canadian content is thriving online. It's also thriving on Netflix. Netflix is not required to provide Canadian content. Yet, Netflix includes Canadian content and both Canadian movies and TV programs in its Canadian service and in other markets where we operate. Our members want to access a broad catalog of both local and international content. With each new market entry, Netflix focuses on acquiring lo local content. Likewise, when we launched our Canadian service, Netflix made a decision to acquire Canadian content. Regulation was not a factor in this decision. Serving our members' viewing interests was. Netflix's commitment to Canadian content is market-oriented and driven by subscriber demand and their viewing habits. Netflix's libraries include content from the CBC, the NFB, and from a range of independent Canadian producers, including TV shows, movies, and documentaries. We offer many Canadian titles, not only here in Canada, but globally to Netflix members in countries like the U.S. and the U.K. and elsewhere. Some examples from our Canadian library include Republic of Doyle, Cairo Time, Nuage sur la Ville, Le Cine Vito, Caillou, One Week. On the U.S. service, we have Bomb Girls, Murdoch Mysteries, Caillou again, The Borgias, and The Tudors. Given the popularity of Canadian content on our services, Netflix believes that regulatory intervention online is unnecessary and could have consequences that are inconsistent with the interests of consumers. Finally, I'd like to turn to what this all means for Canada's media policy and regulatory framework from Netflix's perspective. The television marketplace is changing, and media policy should adapt to it. We urge the Commission to adapt in a way that will allow today's dynamic market to continue, rather than extending a legacy framework to new media. It's not Netflix's intent to express any opinion on the efficacy or the desirability of the current regulatory framework as it applies to traditional broadcasting today. Indeed, many broadcasters may wish to take, continue to take advantage of the regulatory benefits and support afforded to them under this system. For example, the protection and the commercial value of licensed market entry, dedicated capacity on a controlled access network to reach consumers, and direct or indirect access to subsidies for programming. Netflix does not enjoy these benefits, but nor do we seek them. Instead, we believe that the CRTC's historically light-touch approach to the online video space creates an environment that's more likely to produce increased consumer choice, content diversity, 
innovation, higher value, and lower prices. Given this success, regulating Internet content appears unnecessary. Worse still, it could generate outcomes inconsistent with public policy objectives. For example, it is not in the interest of consumers to have new media subsidize old media or to have new entrants subsidize incumbents. It is not in the interest of consumers for regulation to reinforce the market power of incumbent, vertically integrated carrier BDU ISP broadcasters at the expense of innovative new entrants. And it's not in the interest of consumers for regulation to create disincentives to competition, innovation, consumer choice, or access to increased diversity of online content for Canadians. In today's competitive environment, reliance on market forces is the best way to support the future success of Canadian television. We think this cautions against the application of regulation, however well-intentioned, that might inadvertently usurp Canadian consumers' ability to vote with both their dollars and their eyeballs to shape the media marketplace into one that best suits their needs and their demands. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh Vice Chair, we'll start off the question. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for uh, seeing us so wordy this morning. Um, you keep speaking about the the open internet mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the closed internet. I don't know if you're uh, just to sort of make things clear. Uh, are you? I'll just. I'll let you answer the question instead of sort of putting words in your mouth. Are you referring to authenticated services? Are you referring to net neutrality issues, or all of the above? Uh, primarily referring to net neutrality issues because Netflix is accessed via, open, via the open internet. We're subject to the application of data caps. We're subject to uh, traffic management practices that could adversely impact our business. The CRTC obviously has measures in place to protect Canadian consumers. We think those remain incredibly important and we think Canada should be a model for other jurisdictions including the U.S. which right now is struggling itself with a net neutrality framework and reinstating protections for consumers. Yeah. You, you participated last week in a, a voluntary net neutrality slowdown, Netflix did, mm -hmm. where we were all sort of subject to watching that little guy turn round and round yeah. and round. Um, that went well for you? Uh, it did go well. Uh, I, in the U.S., uh, the record at the FCC docket for largest number of comments for many years had been the uh, purview of Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction back in 2005. Yes. Uh, the slowdown pushed the net neutrality comments from the public over the 1.5 million threshold to a new record-breaking 3 million comment threshold, which I think is indicative of the importance of this issue to consumers in America. There's some noise south of the border that Netflix may have intentionally um, used its subscribers as pawns in the net neutrality game in the following way, in that they knowingly slow down their own video streaming uh, through privileged relationship with uh, backbone providers. Um, and this happened around the time of the um, appeal, appellate court decision, the DC court decision, um, through their relationship with, uh, with Level 3 and Cogent. And at the same time would publish, um, and to, to blame the ISPs for that slowdown, even though it was not the ISPs, uh, the ISPs were not the source of that slowdown, but in effect Netflix and uh, Cogent 3 were. And at the same time they would register um, speeds, internet speeds, to show that that wasn't the case. And most of this happened around the time or just before um, the deliberations on the net neutrality uh, file uh, involving Verizon um, v. FCC. Do you want to speak on that issue? I think first off I would say don't believe everything you read on the internet. Um, Can I ask, so is there an investigation that's, that's been opened by the FCC as regards yes, to the uh, backbone market? Uh, the, the investigation is not into the backbone market, it is into interconnection arrangements with terminating access ISP. These are consumer-facing ISPs that consumers uh, purchase broadband access from. Uh, we actually asked the FCC to open the investigation. The allegations that we slowed our traffic or otherwise responsible for degrading our user service are categorically untrue. The interconnection arrangements are about a few large U.S. providers who are leveraging market dominance to demand access fees at the point of interconnection. 
Generally, Netflix and other providers don't pay access fees to reach end users. And this is one of the reasons we've asked the FCC to open investigation to extend their net neutrality rules to the point of interconnection. And moreover, in reviewing several large uh, merger transactions at both DOJ and the FCC, we've encouraged the authorities to very closely scrutinize how these players are utilizing their existing market power, which will grow with the mergers, to actually raise barriers to entry for competing video services. And net neutrality applies to peering as well? Net neutrality in the U.S. technically appear, appeal, excuse me, applies to the last mile yes. and is typically excluded interconnection. Mm -hmm. However, the point of interconnection to the last mile is merely an extension of the existing market power and leverage that comes from being able to withhold access to consumers. And you would not want uh, we would want that to be regulated. You would. We would like the traditionally it has not been regulated. Uh, well, in the 2010 order, it was excluded in no. part because it was vague about what type of interconnection. There's many points of interconnection on the internet. Interconnection is what puts the word inter into internet. Um, but we're really talking about a very small subset of interconnection relationships, precisely the traffic handoff to the ISP on the way to the consumer. Those are points of interconnection that are solely under the control of the ISP in which they can use to create bottleneck leverage over competing online providers. And have you had any such experiences in Canada? No, uh, I have to say that we have had very uh, positive partnerships with Canadian ISPs in terms of getting our traffic to them. And so to date, this is really limited to four extraordinarily large providers in the United States. Okay. Um, you talked about online media uh, being interactive and demand driven. You would agree that VOD services are exactly the same? I'm not sure that they're exactly the same. I think that they are a step closer to a consumer demand driven product. But the universe is still, uh, I think, more limited than some other online media. And uh, while that may be evolving, I think a, a business model like Netflix is actually slightly different in terms of making available seasons all at once uh, and kind of a, a broader breadth of content. Most video on demand content is frequently still tied and authenticated to a traditional cable subscription, and that can limit the content available. But to your point, I do think that it is an evolution towards the type of consumer demand-driven uh, experience that I think people are increasingly requesting. The differentiator would be that you would not be able to get full seasons and and and. and that's one seasons. example. I mean, I think another example is VOD is still a closed system and a controlled access pipe where services like Netflix are very different in that. So that's a differentiator, not the fact that it's demand driven or interactive, because those services are demand driven and interactive. You would agree? Certainly. I think there's, there's gradations of uh, demand driven interactive services, and you can fall somewhere along the spectrum. I think that a lot of online media are really at the far end of consumer demand driven, but surely there are lots of other services that fall in that spectrum as well. Maybe move away from the pipes. And I love talking to, about the pipes. Yeah, so well, let's talk about uh, entertainment and what uh, what entertains people. And um, we've spoken uh, over the past couple of weeks about where the landscape will be in five to ten years. Um, you talked about the fact, more so in your in your intervention in June than in today's document, about the move uh, being constantly towards probably more online viewing. Um, where will we be five to ten years? And I understand, I also read your document, I know that it's difficult to uh, be a crystal ball gazer. Um, but give it your best shot, given your company's experience and, and the worldwide footprint and, and your involvement in that. Sure. Uh, as you say, it's always difficult to predict. But uh, I think consistent with the remarks that we've made and that our CEO has made, people are moving to this world of pure on-demand driven uh, media. But I think that many existing media companies as well as new media companies uh, are going to be moving to that space and transitioning their models to that. I think that many of the players that we see today will be players tomorrow and there will be additional players on top of it in part because online the barriers to entry are lower. Uh, 
and that helps to incent more people to enter into the market. I think that that's a good thing. It offers more choices. It offers more competition and more differing perspectives and diversity of content that they can provide to consumers. People speak of a tipping point. Um, and you spoke in your, in your document about the complementary nature of, of your service. Um, you didn't speak about it in today's um, presentation, but how much longer before we reach that tipping point where you're no longer a complementary service, online services as a whole, um, not unauthenticated services, uh, free internet services as a whole, um, take up so much room that, that we reach that point? Uh, I think it's difficult to predict a tipping point. I think this will be a slow evolution and that will help to transition existing players into models that they uh, feel are more responsive to consumers. Um, you know, we believe that we remain a complementary product. Uh, the CRTC has found in its own uh, studies that online video is a complementary product. In part, it's a little bit about how people consume media, which is we think that Netflix is a great service. We like to provide amazing movies and TV shows. But there are things that we don't provide to people that they can get from traditional providers, television providers, and then we'll continue to go there. We don't offer sports. We don't offer live programming. We don't offer news. Those are great pieces of content that uh, many folks do really well. We've chosen not to expend resources that way, and I think as long as different media providers differentiate themselves, there's going to be room for everyone to play. The pie gets bigger. It's not a zero-sum game. Right. Um, thus far, I think the evidence uh, makes that point. Um, oftentimes, people look at tipping points and put sort of dollars and cents next to that, and in order to help one do that, I think you've got to figure out how much um, of the uh, consumption market one entity or X number of entities may be taking out of that market. And in order to, to arrive at a reasonable figure, you've got to have some idea as to what the um, subscriber levels are. Well, I understand your position. I'm going to ask it anyways. Uh, where are you in your subscription in Canada? So we don't publicly disclose subscriber data outside of the U.S. Um, however, we've reached out to counsel at the CRTC to discuss how we can best make that available to you on a confidential basis. Uh, so you'd be willing to provide that through an undertaking? So we're having a conversation with your counsel to assure that information that for us is actually quite commercially sensitive, uh, that we can guarantee that it will be treated confidentially. And I think that those discussions have actually been very productive, and I have every hope that they will continue to do so. Uh, but are you willing to undertake to provide that information? I'm willing to undertake to have conversations with CRTC not my question. counsel. My question is, are you undertaking to provide that information? To, to the extent that the CRTC... Can CRTC protects confidential information every day. We have lots of confidential information, like many government departments. You coming here and suggesting that we don't treat information confidentially is actually a bit offensive. I'm not suggesting that you don't treat information confidentially. We're working with CRTC Council. We've pro proactively reached out to them to help us understand the process. Um, we think that we're being very cooperative in doing that. I'm not suggesting that we're not going to provide you with the document, but it's important for us, given the sensitivity of this, under, this information, to understand all the implications of what submitting information to any entity would be, given the sensitivity of it. But as I said, we're having productive conversations with CRTC Council. Those will continue after this hearing. Do you undertake to provide that information by the end of the day Monday? And as we've published in the recent uh, uh, amendments to the public notice, you are entitled to ask for confidential treatment of that information. Mr. Chairman, I promise you we will continue to speak with CRTC Council. We want to be helpful. We would like to provide information to you that is responsive on a confidential basis. We will continue to have conversations Why with Why can't Council. you just say you will provide it and be subject to the regular confidentiality rules? We will be happy to submit to the confidentiality rules to the extent that that confidentiality can be guaranteed to us. Again, you're suggesting that we aren't protecting confidential information. I, we are just ensuring, because of the sensitivity of the information, that, that confidentiality can be guaranteed. We would do that with any agency, any government entity with which... But right now you're refusing to answer my, my simple question. 
I don't believe that I'm refusing to answer your question. I'm suggesting that we would like to ensure that sensitive information that we submit is treated confidentially. I can assure you all sensitive information that's filed with the Commission is treated sen with sensitivity because it's confidential. We have obligations under the Act. Yes, and, We can and even exclude it from access to information requests. There's a whole regime around this. It's not new. No, and I appreciate your guarantee that our information would be treated confidentially. And if that so is with that, will you undertake to provide that information by the end of the day, Monday? With the CRTC's guarantee that any information that we submit that is confidential will be treated so, we will definitely continue to have conversations and ensure that we can provide that data to you. We're going to take a break. Do you have anything to add before I speak? Uh, no. Uh, well, actually, yes, I do. So we've had a conversation with Council, and one of the reasons we've been having ongoing with conversations with Council was to help us understand the process. We were given to understand that if we submitted information, its confidentiality couldn't be guaranteed. However, if the panel can guarantee that our sensitive and commercially sensitive information will have guaranteed confidential treatment, we would be happy to submit that information to you. Right. Well, thank you for that. Um, you operate under an exemption order that requires you to provide information. Failure to provide information puts at risk your exemption order. So the Commission is ordering you to provide the number of subscribers currently that you have currently in Canada by 5 p.m. Ottawa time Monday. The Commission provides confidential treatment to that information. Mr. Chairman, can the panel guarantee confidential treatment of that information? You are not entitled to a special treatment. We are treating you like every other applicant, intervener, person who appears before the Commission. The Vice Chair will continue his questions. The order stands. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, let's follow that up with an easy Georgetown question. <laughs> okay. Is it so, about sports? No, no, no. It's all about public policy. So you made a couple of, um, you set out three bullets on, on the public policy front. And that any form of regulation um, would uh, not um, be consistent with public policy objectives. Okay. The first one being that we're subsidizing old media by new media entrants. The second one being that uh, we're creating some kind of um, unfair advantage for uh, the incumbents. Um, at the expense of innovative new entrants as opposed to the non-innovative incumbent entrants. Um, do you want to sort of speak to those issues? Yes, I'm, I'm happy to speak to those issues. And, and I think the threshold issue, a uh, question for the, the CRTC is, uh, is regulation necessary to achieve the benefits that you're seeking under the Broadcasting Act, aside from the harms that I've, I've laid out? So I think the threshold matter is, given that Canadian content is being distributed by online services who are not required to provide it, but do it because it's in our business interest to do it, it's in our interest to serve Canadian consumers with that content, uh, is there a proactive case for regulation? We think that there's not. I would also suggest that there is a, a negative case, as I laid out in the points, basically suggesting, <coughs> excuse me, that um, forcing online new ma media to pay into a fund without a measurable benefit on the other side would seek to essentially cement the position of incumbency for many broadcasters who have operated in this country and because of their vertically integrated status can effectively access that fund directly or indirectly in ways that Netflix as a uh, foreign service cannot. But once you would contribute to the fund, you would have access to that fund as well? I don't believe don't so. so. We are a, not a licensed broadcaster. We are a foreign entity. Um, the other thing that I would add is that when you're talking about new entrants into a field like this, one of the benefits of online services that barriers to entry are fairly, to, are fairly low. Now, 
buying content is always expensive. That is always going to be a barrier. But absent having to uh, put resources to lay infrastructure, but being able to access consumers through an open Internet keeps those barriers entry low. Having uh, levies applied that as a new entrant you would have to pay would actually raise the barriers to entry and make it more difficult for new, smaller services to get off the ground. Okay. I'm not sure I agree with all that, but we'll accept Reasonable your answer as if different. that's where you're at. <laughs> Listen, um, you've heard, we've heard a lot about your, your expansion plans in Europe, and, and uh, there are plans to uh, produce um, French content and original content, and we talk to people talk about Marseille uh, on a regular basis. and. Um, and uh, House of Cards south of the border. Um, how long do we have to wait for uh, a Canadian House of Cards or Marseille or something to that effect? So we are engaging in original Canadian programming content. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we have commissioned revival seasons of Trailer Park Boys, which is, as you may know, is a very popular Canadian show. This is much along the lines of the original that we did, uh, Arrested Development, in the U.S., where we took a show that was no longer running on traditional television but had a dedicated audience, and we revived that. Um, we are also – sorry. No, it's fine. No, I appreciate all that. It's, yeah. it's pretty much on the public record um, through your press clippings and others, some of the programs that you're reviving and the programs that you've, uh, that mm -hmm. you've purchased. Um, but the kind of investment – uh, that would be the equivalent of a House of Cards in Marseille for a Canadian um, equivalent, if you like, or that kind of commitment and that kind of budget um, to a series in Canada that would that thereafter be available throughout the world. Certainly. Well, one of the originals that we're filming in Canada is Hemlock Grove, and that is actually a very um, extensive high-budget production. It's filmed in Toronto. It uses Canadian cast and crew, uh, and that is something that we distribute all over the globe. It is not technically Canadian content with the CRT, within the CRTC standards. It's not a Canadian production company, but it is filming and taking advantage of the wonderful, faci wonderful facilities and, and production uh, values that you have here. I in understand that, but when can we expect to see... Um, I'm trying to remember the Dutch uh, program that originally launched. Was it Norwegian? Um, Lillehammer. Lillehammer, yes. yes. And uh, something that would be typically Canadian and that would reflect Canada and would be on the scale of a Marseille uh, or a House of Cards. I think all I can say is that we're There are no plans in the works for that. Uh, we're always looking at new projects. I, to be honest, I, I, I can't speak to plans because many of these things that are in production are confidential until we release them. Um, but we are always searching for new ways to bring new and exciting content, both here in Canada and abroad. We generally tend to be uh, country agnostic. We're looking for amazing content, but there's also lots of amazing content here in Canada in the works, and we look forward to seeing what we can bring to market. Okay, let's get back to some more numbers. Um, you've committed to, uh, undertaken to supply the commission with your subscriber um, the Canadian subscribers. Would you also, um, the next question would be as regards revenues in Canada? Uh, similarly, those are confidential information. Under the same confidential? If they can be assured confidential treatment, we would be happy to provide those to the Commission confidentially. The Commission's ordering you to provide that information uh, by 5 p.m. Monday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Confidentiality will be granted to the information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Programming spend in Canada. Uh, programming spend. Production. Okay. Let's start with production on one end and what you're paying for Canadian works. So uh, there's a, a couple issues there. One is that w it's not unilaterally within our power to disclose terms of contracts. We have obligations to parties that we enter into those contracts with. So I cannot disclose deals. An aggregated and, figure as to how much you're spending for Canadian content that finds itself on your server. So um, let me add uh, some color to that to help us sift through this, which is we don't track Canadian content 
on our site within the definition of the CRTC's criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a Canadian genre that includes a number of movies, TV shows, and documentaries that are filmed in Canada, have prominent Canadian directors, actors, etc. Would you um, be able to provide us with Canadian producers, Canadian uh, productions in that sense? Uh, I th consistent with the conversation we've had about Certainly. confidentiality? Yes, we can. Are you undertaking to do it, or do we have to order you? If you can guarantee the confidentiality the of... The Commission is ordering you to provide the, no that the information the Vice Chair has just asked, and to do so by 5 p.m. Ottawa time, Monday. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Confidentiality will be granted to the Thank information. You. So, production expenditure in Canada? And uh, programming expenditure in Canada? Can you uh, clarify what you mean by production expenditure? Everything that's produced in Canada, Hemlock Grove, is orange still produced here? Uh, no, orange is, uh, it's believe it's produced in New York. We do have, uh, we do dubbing in Quebec for orange, for Orange is the New Black and for House of Cards. Okay. So we use independent facilities here to, to dub into French. Uh, I don't know if that would fall into your production category, um, but I can, I You're can make see. a subcategory for, uh, okay. sub, uh, Dubbing. Dubbing, thank you. I was thinking voiceover. So, <laughs> dubbing subcategory. Uh, production, you've commissioned um, um, a couple of um, other programs in Canada. You mentioned them earlier. Uh, are you referring to Trailer Park Boys? No. I'm sorry? Trailer Park Boys. Trailer Park Boys, yeah. and there was something else. Uh, we have some original comedy specials. Um, but the, I, I can't provide individual content spends because, again, no, because of no. the third-party obligations. Globally, what Netflix is investing in production in Canada. Is that fine? Uh, do you all, you, you're undertaking to do that? Subject to the terms that we've discussed before, Mr. Chairman, if you can guarantee the confidentiality, we will be I've happy. never used the word guarantee. I have said we are ordering you to provide it, and I'm doing so again with the question the, chair, the Vice Chair just asked, and it will be granted confidentiality. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, would you also be in a position to uh, tell us how many um, Canadians are um, circumventing um, and, and acquiring access to Netflix content through an IP address in the U.S.? So I'm glad that you brought up the issue of VPNs. Uh, it's very sensitive to us, and the use of a VPN to access a Netflix service that is extraterritorial from where the user is is a violation of our terms of use. Um, it's a sensitive issue to us not only because it implicates the licensing contracts that we have with our content partners. We are also producers of original content, and so uh, it has profound implications for us as well. It's not a Netflix-specific problem. It's something that we're grappling with as an industry as a whole, both content producers and online uh, content distributors. So what, one thing I was hoping to do is talk a little bit about what we do to block uh, illicit circumvention uh, through VPN of Netflix territorial geo-filtering. Um, but I, I feel like I need to say it as an initial matter, excuse me, initial matter that not all use of VPNs is illicit. There are a lot of large corporations that use it to facilitate secure information being transferred between employees at remote locations. There's a lot of consumers that use VPNs to protect their privacy online. What we do at Netflix is that we use an industry standard third-party service that looks at IP addresses that we provide and compares it to where the user is being, where the user is originated, and to the extent that those don't sync. Okay. We block access to that. Uh, how effective would you say your geogating is through VPN? It is as effective as the industry standard available. Right. But it's the the issue is that if we can determine that someone is illicitly using a VPN, we block it. That is the information that we have about usage of VPN that is inconsistent with our terms of use, but that would be the only information we'd have is so where we would detect it. Technologically, you'd be incapable of providing us with the number of Canadians that are circumventing your geogating. We don't have information on that. We block IP addresses where we detect illicit use of VPN that violates our terms of use. Okay. Um, 
part of the rationale behind the exemption order is that um, services exempt would contribute to the production, as I mentioned earlier, the distribution, um, the discoverability, the visibility, the promotion of Canadian productions. Um, speak to me on what you, how your service contributes to the production, distribution, and more importantly, discoverability of Canadian audiovisual programming. Certainly. So, as we said in our written submission in, in our remarks, we license Canadian content on the open market. We uh, pay content creators, producers. We distribute it here in Canada. We distribute it in our services outside of Canada. So in terms of our contribution, it's a market-driven and it's a consumer-facing one where we buy content that we think our members will love. In terms of promoting that content on the website, uh, there's a couple ways to think of it. Um, so we have a Canadian genre, and as I said before, this includes uh, titles that have Canadian themes, Canada is the country of origin. They've got prominent Canadian directors, actors, etc. Within that genre, we have up to 175 Canadian subgenres, depending on the content that's at the service at the same time. At the time, so and how, how are those genres promoted? So you can actually, if you there's a drop-down menu, in yep. if you select Canadian con, Canadian uh, programming, you can select those subgenres. In addition to that, um, people frequently talk about our recommendation engine, our algorithm. And it's, it's more properly understood as a set of algorithms that interact together. And a lot of those are user driven and they build off information that we have about what members have enjoyed. So uh, if you like a show, we look at other people who have liked that show and other shows that they have liked and recommended to you. So here is a sort of personal anecdote of mine in the U.S., which is I really like to watch um, mysteries. I am a bit of an Agatha Christie buff, so I watch Agatha Christie's Poirot. I rated it highly. I got recommended Murdoch Mysteries. I enjoyed Murdoch Mysteries. I got recommended Bomb Girls because there are common themes and preferences among our members who have watched these shows, they've also enjoyed the others. So if you have a penchant for a particular genre type of content, it's likely to be self-reinforcing in terms of the other content that you're watching and that's recommended to you. And is the interface different in Canada than it is in the U.S.? No, they're largely the same. It mostly uh, it, it differs kind of device to device. We don't have a, a, a genre of Canadian content in the U.S. That's specific to Canada because it's to help. But in Canada, do you have that in Canada? Yes, we do. So Canadian tuning on Netflix. And it would have been nice given the importance of uh, discoverability if you sort of brought us um, a prop by way of video uh, to show uh, the commission and the audience. Um, I'm sorry to be propless, but I'm how, happy you know. to provide screenshots to the commission that can show how, how this is discovered. Great. Like I said, it would have been nice if you had sort of brought that in today. But uh, we'll uh, I'll know for next forgive time. your uh, propless uh, <laughs> this, this morning. Um, tell me something. Uh, how would prescribing production change anything? Prescribing production? Requesting, um, commissioning, um, productions, um, Canadian audiovisual programming. How would that change and how would that affect um, our beloved sense of innovation? Well, I think that any time there is a government prescription when it comes to creative works, there's always the danger that you supplant more market-driven forces. And we think that those have been really effective to date um, in promoting content that our members want to see and they like. And frankly, this includes Canadian content. As we've said, we've proactively licensed Canadian content not because anybody told us to, but because we thought our members would enjoy it. And when we see our members enjoying it, that reinforces our decision. Would you also have numbers on um, the consumption of, of Canadian um, programming by Canadians? You track that? Who's of hitting the what genre, shows? Right, yes, not of the, the genre. Yeah. And what kind of viewing there is of Canadian uh, programming in Canada and elsewhere? 
We would have. You should be able. You'd be able to provide that. We wouldn't be able to do it on a title by title basis because, again, we would consider that to be very sensitive information. Any information in not title by title, but the genre as a whole. We may be able to provide numbers sort of broadly on that. Um, the there is a Canadian algorithm, is there not? I mean, if you, as you I say, wouldn't if you say it was a Canadian algorithm. Mm -hmm. I would say. Um, so part of the complication of exploring, of explaining this is that it, literally there are multiple algorithms that are interacting with each other and it's not the case that necessarily one dominates because it's, it's, it's user generated and reinforcing. There is, we do take into consideration country of origin now that may be literally it was filmed in Canada, that's the country of origin, and, and that may be indicative sometimes that it's in fact Canadian content. Sometimes it's sort of more thematic. So they'll have some false positives there. You may have uh, a director like James Cameron, who is you know, an amazing Canadian director, and you could have one of his movies fall under the Canadian uh, genre, but uh, some of you may not consider Titanic, for example, to be a Canadian movie. Um, so. There's, I would have some concern about the reliability. I think it went down in Canadian waters, but that, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I think there might be um, some concern about the reliability for the purposes, the Commission's purposes, I think, of, of looking at that genre sort of holistically for numbers because of some of the false positives. But I do think that there's probably a lot of content in there um, that, that is you know, sort of more spot-on Canadian. And you'd be able to provide that, do you think? If the chairman will order us to provide it, we... Why does he have to order you to provide things once the confidentiality, the confidentiality issue is, uh, is in place? I don't understand why you need to be ordered all the time. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not my intent to be ordered. As I said before, it's just very sensitive information for us. It's competitively sensitive. Um, we were given to understand that in submission, submitting information to the Commission, while it could be given treatment, um, in fact, it could not be guaranteed confidentially if somebody decided to, uh, to request that the Commission make it public and apply a public interest test. And so given the, the nature of this information, we're just trying to be very careful and not to inadvertently uh, submit data that is then released publicly and would put us at a yeah, significant we understand commercial that. I think the assurances have been quite clear. And I appreciate that. Thank Firstly you. and secondly, you pay for Canadian rights. I'm mm -hmm. sure you want to know what kind of uptake that those Canadian rights enjoy. So that must be available somewhere. Uh, I can speak broadly to the genre, yes. Great. And you'll undertake to provide that information? We will provide the information and submit it confidentially to the Commission. Great. Well, that's an undertaking? <laughs> I think so. I'm trying not to get caught up on labels. Right. Well, it's, it's surprising that you wouldn't want to provide us in light of the fact that even in your submission you see, and I'm quoting you, given the popularity of Canadian content on our service, it's in your interest to provide us the evidence that supports the very fact you're arguing. We have absolutely no issue with providing the Commission the information. It, it really is just the confidential treatment, and I, I you know, I, I'm sorry if there's um, any appearance that we're unwilling to do. It is certainly not that we wouldn't want to provide the Commission or to be unhelpful to you. It, when, when you mentioned that you like mysteries, I, I thought there may have been a connection there, that you, uh, the facts were only going to come out slowly. I try to keep my work in private life as separate as I can. I see that. So are you undertaking to provide that information? I'm and sorry, which information? The information. <laughs> <laughs> if I should, we'll About my, my personal life or the... Uh, no. We won't go there. Uh, Canadian, Canadian, <laughs> <laughs> the viewing of Canadian programming uh, in Canada and outside of Canada. You talked about the popularity of Murdoch Mysteries and, and Trailer Park Boys outside so of Canada. The, the difficulty, um, I think, with the outside of Canada issue is that we don't, we don't kind of put that in a Canadian genre outside of Canada. So... Uh, you know that it's popular. You know people are watching it. You know what everyone's watching all the time. Certainly. So, I, so there, 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 there shouldn't be a problem. Um, I'm, it I'm, isn't the problem, I'm, technologically. I'm more speaking about, I'm trying to clarify the data that you're requesting. In Canada, I understand within the, the Canadian genre that we have, and, and I can sort of identify that, in outside of Canada, because we don't have the Canadian genre, um, you know, the, the roll-up of what we would consider Canadian out there may be different. You've and so paid for rights from producers in Canada. 
And as, as long as... And you know if those shows are being watched or not being watched, when they're being watched, how often they're being watched, and who's watching them? To the extent that we are able to submit this confidentially and we can enjoy confidential treatment from the Commission, we obviously want to be helpful in your undertaking in this process. It's just... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, in the Canadian market, you, you have a Canadian genre. So if you take those programs or movies or other audiovisual content that yeah. falls within that definition and take that group of audiovisual works and say, and then aren't you able to take that group of audiovisual work and on an aggregate basis tell us how much that library, that sub-library, is being... Uh, consumed internationally? Uh, because everything is licensed territorially, that sub-library um, may not be contiguous with, with libraries elsewhere. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. And, and I expect that there will be less viewing to Canadian outside Canadian borders. That's entirely normal. Is it not? I have, I have not looked at the data myself, so I, I couldn't hazard a guess on that. Right. Yet you, you, you argue that it, Canadian content is being seen abroad. Certainly it's being seen. It's, it's on our service. Right. It um, sort of undermines your argument if you're not able to substantiate it with evidence. Well, I don't think that that's uh, necessarily true, the fact that I'm not presently able to provide you with specific data on it. Um, when we make decisions to license content in other territories, part of it is based on this algorithm of what we expect will people enjoy. It's, it's a little bit of a bet any time we license content. We have expectations about how content will perform. Um, the way we measure success of content uh, certainly is on how people view it, but it's over the course of the license. So, um, you know, viewing habits of something that is new to the service may be low, whereas something that's been on the service for longer could uh, demonstrate, I think, more effectively uh, its popularity on the service. Because things, uh, they cycle in and out of the service in all territories, it's very difficult to get anything more than a snapshot at a given moment. Um, so, you know, any time we uh, discuss data, which, again, is obviously very sensitive to us, I want to, you know, provide the sort of the attendant caveats of, of how you look at the data and what you read into it, because the way our service works is actually quite different than a, a, a traditional television service in how we look and evaluate content success. But what we read into it is not public consumption, so that, that, that's, that's not a concern, firstly. And secondly, I'm going to help you out. You have a screenshot on your site, Canadian Films. You've identified some films as being Canadian. You've identified some series as being Canadian. You've identified some comedies as being Canadian. They're right here. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you track that content. All we're asking is to see, given that your own words today tell us that Canadian programming is highly popular, show us how and where it's popular. And it's not as if you don't have that information because you've identified some films as Canadian and some series as Canadian. Within okay. our genre, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The aggregate. So the undertaking. So you're undertaking the consumption of Canadian in Canada and abroad, as sure. you define it? Uh, I feel like we've been here before. Um, it, we would like to be as helpful as we can in providing you information confidentially that can help with your, uh, with your process here. Um, so I, I thank you again. I, I will repeat the, the assurances of confidentiality are very important to us given the sensitive information and consistent that, with that we will be able to provide you information that we hope will be responsive to your inquiry. So the Commission is ordering you to provide the information we just requested by the end of the day, 5 p.m. on Monday. Uh, and confidentiality will be granted. The one thing that I, I have to say is some of these, um, some of these data roll-ups that we're talking about here are not something that can be done uh, over the weekend. They're a much more involved process. How much, how much time would it require? I, frankly, it's not something that I can speak to right. here. That's why I'd be happy to Did continue. Did you undertake to at least to provide us by... Uh, in, uh, above the order we've just given you to undertake to update us on Monday how long it would take to I'd provide I'd be happy to undertake to understand exactly how much time we would need to provide data that would be responsive. Thank you. And the order could then be amended appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.
It's a heck of an answer for someone that takes perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars out of the Canadian economy. Ms. Wright. So if you can help us, we'd appreciate it. Vice Chairman, I am obviously very happy to help you. This is not an issue of submitting information to the Commission. It is simply one of protecting commercially sensitive information. I, I'm, I'm not it sure. It is an issue of, of, of submitting information to the Commission. It, well, it, but it's not because it's not the issue of sharing it with, with all of you and to help your decision and review. That's absolutely not the issue here. The, the reality is that this is information that our business considers to be commercially sensitive. And that is really the end of it. Can I ask you a question? Do you pay any sales tax in this country? So Netflix has no presence here in Canada. We don't have any employees. We don't have operations. And we don't have assets. So sales tax does not apply. Um, you have consultants that you've hired? We, you have legal? We don't have any employees in Canada. I understand. Um, you understand, I'm sure, you're aware of the fact that uh, Canada is a bilingual country? We are. Um, can you speak to me on your uh, availab the availability of French programming? I cannot do it in French, sadly, because of my own poor language skills. Uh. There's a guillotine waiting. <laughs> uh, I won't ask you to eat cake. So please. I'm sorry. Speak to us on, on French, uh, French, and 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 uh, I understand that there's a, there's content available that's mm -hmm. French programming. Um, um, Quebec-based, Canadian programming, um, and if you can perhaps also give us the numbers on that spend, we'd appreciate it. Sorry, uh, on programming that, on French programming? Yes, on Canadian French programming. Canadian French programming, um, and again, that would be within a sort of broader, uh, it would be the genre of Canadian programming, not necessarily Canadian content, correct? That's correct. Okay. That's correct and confidentiality will be assured there as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Undertaking by, I think, Monday, 5 Eastern? Uh, again, uh, I will undertake to assess whether or n what the time frame would be to get that information and whether it's available in the company. And then I will be happy to continue to have conversations with legal counsel here at the Commission on how we can make information available to you and be helpful to this process. Then I'm going to have to order you. I appreciate your undertaking to tell us the update, but we're going to have to order you to provide that information by 5 p.m. or whatever date we will amend in light of the uh, answer to your undertaking Monday. Does that work for you? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, speak to us on your policy as it regards the, the video description and closed captioning, please. Certainly. So uh, Netflix is not required, as most OTT services are not required, to provide closed captioning. Um, however, we do think it's important to try to promote accessibility of our service where we can and where it's feasible. So we have voluntarily undertaken to uh, provide closed captioning or subtitling in Canada for the vast majority of titles on our service. So at this point, uh, we have an upwards of 90 percent of the viewables on our service are closed captioned or subtitles, and we very much hope to get that to full coverage uh, in the near future. Uh, would you be able to provide us what percentage of the programming is available, closed captioning, and video description? Uh, we do not provide video description at in any of our services. Okay. We do not. Um, we do have closed captioning numbers that I can share with you. And given the um, uh, aging population and the um, obvious need uh, for video description going forward, are there any plans to make video description available on all your programming? We don't have any formal plans. However, we are very sensitive to this issue and we're always looking to improve the accessibility of our service. So we are certainly looking and exploring ways for us to do that. But we don't have any formal plans at this point. Notwithstanding the fact that a certain, certainly a large percentage of your clientele uh, would benefit from such services? No, we appreciate that, which is why we're looking into seeing how we can better improve the service. We just don't have any formal plans. In your negotiations, and, I, and this, you may find this sensitive as well, um, you negotiate for Canadian rights separately from global rights? Uh, so it depends on the content. Speaking broadly, 
most content is licensed uh, subject to geographical limitations on the licensing of that. Mm -hmm. That changes um, for content on originals or independent films where you can frequently license content globally or for us, you know, the markets that we operate. It just really depends on the content. It goes called content program to program. It's, it's, program. it's, it's, it's frequently um, how it's licensed is the product of commercial negotiations. Sometimes uh, global rights are not available to be licensed. That's the choice of the content owner. Sometimes they want to license a few markets because they've already um, basically sold those rights to folks here in Canada or elsewhere. And so, you know, we can't acquire the rights or we can't acquire the rights for that window. Your principle, your first uh, ask would be to have global rights, would it not? Um, you know, I actually can't speak to that because I'm, I'm not on the content team. I think in, in most cases we would prefer to have global rights, um, uh, but it, it probably depends on the specific piece of content and, and whether it's appropriate for global distribution. Um, speak to me. I'm sure you're proud of your, your children's programming that's available on Netflix. Would you speak to us on that issue? Um, we are. And, and what? And, and again, with a Canadian slant. <laughs> I, I'm trying to do everything with a Canadian slant today. Great. Um, <laughs> Got to work on that accent, though. I know. Process, right? Yes. I know. It's a, it's method. a gift. Method. 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 Go on. Yes, I think. Go on. <laughs> um, so uh, children's content does really well on Netflix, I think, for a number of reasons. People find it appealing to have a service where they can find uh, content for their children that they think is appropriate, that they think is safe, that doesn't have commercials around it. Um, so we have both a you know, we have a kid zone that has uh, children's content, and you can limit it to whatever sort of age specific and appropriate range. Do you have a kid zone, a youth zone? Do you, and, and what uh, ages are? So I can, I'm happy, I don't have that at my fingertips right now, but I'm happy Again, to. Again, you could have brought it to us on, on video. Apologies. High tech um, company that you are, but please <laughs> do your best, propolis. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we try to break into it, I'd say sort of normal uh, children age ranges, you sort of looking at, at younger children, sort of the, the five to seven range, and then you get into sort of older children and adolescent, and you can break out uh, content, and it's, it's generally based on, um, you know, standardized ratings in uh, Canada or the U.S. that the content creators have assigned to the program. And could you also tell us how much you're contributing to the bottom line of Canadians? Um, in your purchases of, of children's programming. Um, we have a rich tradition of children's programming no, in this country, as you know. I, I'm, I am aware of it, and I am I'm frequently told by people both in the U.S. and Canada that shows like Caillou and Arthur are obviously extremely popular with, uh, with people's children. Around the world. Around the world. Yeah. I mostly hear it in the U.S. and Canada. Right. Um, <laughs> would you be able to tell us, would you be able to create a, a category... Um, in terms of children's programming and, and what your uh, programming uh, availability and costs are for children's programming. So um, you, have, you, have a, you have a genre, you have a subcategory on your um, that's available uh, as a screenshot. So uh, they're clearly identified the, the children's programming. Yes. Are you talking about children's programming as a whole, or you're talking about the the Canadian? Uh, children's programming. Again, um, I actually don't know if we have a subgenre of Canadians' children programming. We probably do. I just don't recall at the top of my if head. If you do have it identified, would you be able to tell us how much um, you spend acquiring those rights? Um, consistent with... Canadian. Consistent Canadian. with certainly um, your concerns over confidentiality. Uh, yes, we will. Uh, again, I, I have to uh, assess what information... <laughs> we have that would be responsive to that. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head, um, whether or not the, how the breath would, would break down. But There's, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. To the best of your ability, obviously. To the best of my ability. Yeah. Uh, there's also a lot of chatter about Netflix um, being available on set-top boxes uh, in the US and Canada. Um, would you speak to us on that issue? And, and where that sort of lines up with smart TVs Sure, um, and, and I'm aware of uh, our set-top box placement in the U.S. I'm not sure if we're on any set-top boxes here in Canada. Um, we basically, we strive to be on consumer devices uh, that, you know, make it easy for people 
to watch Netflix. And in this sense, a, a set-top box provided by AD, BDU is obviously, or an MVPD in the U.S., so is a, a fairly ubiquitous device. We don't really see this any differently than being on a TiVo box or being on a smart TV. It's, uh, it's just another means of, of um, uh, accessing Netflix. But I don't believe that we're on any set-top boxes here in Canada. And in the U.S.? Uh, in the U.S., we're in um, a, a very few smaller providers, usually that uh, use TiVo as their set-top box. They have license from TiVo. And so we're on the TiVo platform already in most cases. And so these providers who have licensed the TiVo box as their set-top box, these uh, MVPDs in this case, um, they, they will have. But it's, it's uh, mostly at this point it's the smaller systems who are experimenting with it. And is the MVPD... Um collecting the subscription fee for you? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, I, I don't know, and if so, it, it would probably de depend on individual uh, arrangements. Okay. Um, but we are not, in, in no case, I should, uh, to be clear, in no case are we sort of ceding Netflix to the control or somehow uh, allowing our user interface and our consumer experience to be um, sort of co-opted through the arrangement. We're really just looking, it's, it's basically a piece of hardware, a consumer electronic device that allows people uh, to access it. It's um, less, I think, uh, it's less different than, than our other arrangements with other consumer electronics manufacturers, it's, it's just it's not something that has typically been done. Uh, most MVPDs in the U.S. Um, have uh, had, had mixed feelings about Netflix's entry into the U.S., but I'm happy to say that most of those partnerships are now quite productive. And how would that be different um, from an SVOD? Oh, well, it's delivered completely differently. Uh, More of an app than... Certainly more than an app, the techno technology behind how it's accessed, the de dedicated capacity versus delivery over the open Internet. Being in a set-top box in no way changes Netflix's delivery. It's really just a user interface difference. It's, a, it's basically on your smart TV when you're toggle toggling between your smart hub and accessing an application or you're going to your uh, cable provider's uh, you know, linear grid. They're just, you know, they're, they're funneling you to different means of accessing programming, but they're accessed via different ways. Right. Um, let me take you overseas briefly. I mean, you've recently uh, been a lot of um, talk about your launch in, in Europe and, and France specifically, and I mentioned Marseille earlier. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the plan from everything I've read is that you'll be at four or five million subs um, over the next um, three or four years if media reports are to be believed. You shouldn't always believe media reports. I know. Um, it's quite ambitious, but uh, I think those are your, some of those statements um, come from Netflix themselves. So mm -hmm. I guess you, the opposite <laughs> you should be careful what you say. Um, right. <laughs> quite ambitious, given that Canal Plus is only at 500,000 subs on their streaming service. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the pay services in France. Uh, Netflix is familiar with it. I don't generally, uh, my... my area of purview is here in Canada and the U.S., and so I am less involved with our, our uh, operations in Europe and specifically our, our launch in France this week. There are uh, media reports, um, some of them, my understanding is, and we'll ask for clarification, citing Netflix authorities, that Netflix has agreed to pay the 2% French Cultural Ministry's uh, VOD tax for um, audiovisual revenue north of 10 million euros. If you cannot answer that question today, would you please undertake to answer that question? I cannot answer that question today. I don't know the answer, but I will so get back to you. So the French Ministry of Culture uh, imposes, amongst all their other taxes, a 2% VOD tax. And Netflix has agreed to pay that tax. Just to make the, the question clear. Certainly. It's a 2% uh, VOD yes. tax on audiovisual revenue north of 10 million euros. So uh, I will happily get back to you with that information. I'm sorry, I, I don't have the answer here. And that right Netflix now. has also agreed not to... Well, that's an undertaking. That's an <laughs> end of Monday. Is that all right? Yes, thank you. Thank you.
Netflix has also agreed not to show uh, films that are less than three years uh, of age since their initial uh, distribution. I will happily go back and, and confirm that for you. Okay. Um, you may or may not be aware that uh, France's culture of state, a, a body which advises the French government on legal issues, has recommended government oversight over the algorithm that Netflix uses to present services in movies to um, assure uh, the, cult the cultural ministry that French content will be appropriately positioned um, on the uh, opening page of Netflix. If, if you're not aware of that, would you please take that away and answer uh, that question for us by end of day Monday? Yeah, I cannot speak to that, to that issue. I will, I will get back to you with that information. So specifically the French councils of the states uh, oversight over the Netflix algorithm to assure that French content has pride of place um, once we, uh, for, for Netflix uh, subscribers. Okay. And the same is true in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, um, by, by registering yourselves in the Netherlands, obviously you don't have to respect the 40% content um, requirement for uh, French television, radio, and uh, theatrical releases. Uh, but the VOD tax does apply, apparently. And uh, the same is true in Netherlands. You don't have to respect the 50% on-demand requirement. Uh, but the requirement for discoverability um, and uh, appropriate access to Dutch and European content, Netflix has apparently um, agreed to respect that element of uh, Dutch uh, cultural policy. So if you could speak, please speak to that issue as well for us by uh, Monday end of day. Yes. So as you can see, other, other nations around the world have some of these cultural concerns. You well, should I, not be surprised. Well, I, I think we endeavor to be sensitive to cultural concerns in every market where we enter. I don't think that that's, that's a question for us. Well, I, I thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's all for me. I don't know if anyone else wants to ask questions. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe it's worth taking a few moments uh, for people maybe less familiar with uh, our proceeding and they may be wondering what's going on here. Uh, we haven't made any decisions. We're not leaning in any particular direction. But some parties in this proceeding have raised some issues and it's our duty to examine those. Um, for instance, and it's a fact-based issue. And in fact, some of the facts we're requesting may actually support Netflix's argument. Would you not agree with that? Oh, uh, certainly. And as I said, um, it, the issue is not providing information to the CRTC. We, we want to be helpful in this process. That's why we, we undertook our written submission, and that's why we answered your invitation to attend here today. And, and we're thankful uh, for you to have done that. And you, you make a good, cogent argument. But for those observing from the outside, they may be wondering what is going on. And I just wanted to assure them that, you know, whether or not we exempt something or not, and the terms under which we do it is very much a fact-based issue, and so we need the, the evidence. Uh, we always come to determination based on our legislative mandate and coupled with the evidence. It's not any different than any other administrative tribunals here in Canada and around the world. Um, you know, we have hundreds of proceedings every year, uh, both in telecom and broadcasting, and often, and very often, evidence is filed in confidence. And we often give confidential treatment, particularly uh, where uh, markets are, are competitive. We appreciate that. Thank you. And we do that every day. But we do treat everyone equally. And we are not asking for special treatment, so I appreciate it. Thank you. A couple of questions. Um, you, you make the point, validly, because consumer interests are very much are, uh, at the heart of this proceeding, but the Commission's legislative mandate also uh, considers the perspective of Canadians as creators and uh, Canadians as, as citizens. Uh, and I want to give you uh, an opportunity uh, to explain and articulate why you think your position 
uh, in overall is also good for Canadians as creators and Canadians as citizens? Certainly. Um, so uh, there's a couple way to think a couple ways to think about a service like Netflix. Um, and we've discussed how we think we contribute through market-based and consumer mechanisms to extending uh, the life of Canadian content that has aired previously on Canadian television and now has found a home in Netflix's library, bringing it outside the country to find new audiences for Canadian content. Um, I think, as I alluded to in my remarks, um, the diversity of content that I think a lot of over-the-top providers have some more freedom and luxury to provide based on the fact that, at least, for example, for our business model, we're not, um, we're not sort of driven by the everyone has to sit down at 8 p.m. and watch a show at once for us to justify it as a legitimate expenditure for a service allows us to be a little bit more uh, risk-taking. We can... Um, we can buy documentaries that may be slightly controversial or that wouldn't otherwise find a home through traditional venues. And so that is great for Canadian content creators who are engaged in that. It's also great uh, for Canadian consumers, particularly to the extent that some of this information, these, this content may touch upon um, important subject matter, uh, political subject matter, um, issue, international issues, cultural issues. Um, and we strive to have a wide breadth of content on our service that can um, appeal to a broad and diverse set of interests. It's not to say that we can be everything to everyone. As I said before, we don't offer live sports. We don't do news. Um, that's great content. It's not our business model. Um, but we think that we can kind of contribute to, uh, to consumers' learning, to their enjoyment, to their entertainment through the diversity of content that we can offer on our service. Um, thank you. Um, I was... Too bad we got off on a completely different tangent this morning because I was more interested in finding out about promotion and how you, you deal with the world of promotion as mm -hmm. an innovative, cutting-edge uh, company. Um, and uh, I've noted you do promotion um, in more traditional media, mm -hmm. both of your service and of your programs. In fact, mm -hmm. it's somewhat ironic that you go to uh, traditional television sometimes to promote your... Uh, uh, your nonlinear uh, service and your nonlinear programming. Uh, and that is part of your strategy, I take it. Uh, you know, we're always experimenting with different marketing avenues. Um, we change it up frequently to see how best we're reaching people. Um, marketing, I think, is um, more important when we have new entry into a market when people are unfamiliar with the service. After we've had some time, as we've had in the U.S. and Canada, where people are more familiar, um, marketing uh, becomes uh, less, I think, certainly not necessary, but it is less prominent than it would be in markets where people have never heard of Netflix at all. Right. And I, I take it that uh, using programs, whether they're actually new licensed uh, uh, programs uh, or, in fact, original programs that you've, you've financed is something you use to get people to come to your, your service as well. So that's why we see that as – is that – uh, commercials that feature characters from our original shows? Yeah. Yes, and I think part of it is um, – with original content that we have, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, Helmlock Grove, things like that, um, we want those shows to be identified with Netflix. Um, and they've, they've done, I think, tremendous, um, tremendously positive things for us as a brand, as well as, I think, ensuring that um, people who enjoy Netflix will continue to enjoy it and stay on the service because, um, as, as you may be aware, it's extremely easy to quit us. <laughs> Uh, and in an age of, uh, of abundance of audiovisual content, uh, would you agree that it becomes even more important to uh, focus on the promotion aspect of getting, connecting uh, whatever the views are of Canadian or foreign viewers to the content on your service? Yeah, I mean, I think promotion is important. It's, um, it, it's certainly not the be-all, end-all. And as I said, it tends to be more important in markets where people have never heard of Netflix at all. In markets that are more, where we're more established, um, 
people are familiar with the service and they can kind of really, I think, take the service for what it does best, which is using what they've already watched and what they like compared to what other people have watched and liked and use that to promote internally other shows that they may never have thought about um, but are there to discover. Right. Um, and I think that that's a, I think that that's an exciting part of, of how we recommend things to right. people. And that's the, the emerging uh, over a number of years now uh, uh, aspect of promotion done through discoverability, as you mentioned and described earlier uh, by mm -hmm. to, uh, Vice Chair's questions on various algorithms you use to, uh, to, to, to discover that content. Mm -hmm. um, and you explained how that, that works. But you, you do store because those algorithms are not just based on databases of, you know, what stars, what kind of films, is it uh, uh, animation or is it romantic or things like that. You're actually, it's also linked to the um, viewer's own choices and I guess their friends to the extent you're um, connecting. Not so much their friends, although we do have a social function that some people take advantage of. Right. It's, it's more that, um, so uh, do, you, do you have a favorite show? I have many favorite shows. Okay, sorry. I guess that's an, that's probably a loaded question for the CRTC chair. Um, so uh, let me. I'm trying to give an example. Uh, so I watch. Why not use Big Bang Theory because everybody seems to like that. Oh, oh, I was hoping for something a little less ubiquitous. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, let's take something Canadian. How about that? Uh, I watch Murdoch Mysteries. I have my my star rating, uh, and I, I give it a four. You also watched Murdoch Mysteries. You gave it a four. Right. The algorithm looks at a show that you also watched and gave a high rating to um, and, you know, thousands of people like you and then recommends to me because I similarly gave um, Murdoch Mysteries a high rating right. and recommends something. Now, it's a bit of a vast um, oversimplification because we're talking about algorithms and algorithms and there's multiple things that kind of overlay on that um, so the fact that I may like mysteries may be one component the fact that uh, I appear to have a predilection for Canadian shows may also inform that and so because we have subscribers whose preferences we can inform to make choices for other subscribers uh, it's really the system kind of reinforces based on what the viewer likes him or herself right and you, you, somewhere you store that information uh, that the viewers, I mean, it must be somewhere. St uh, the, the information about what viewers are actually viewing and selecting, or else the algorithms wouldn't work, right? We, we have anonymized information about what people are watching, yes. But it, it is related to an individual, is it not? It pulls from the account, yes. Right. And where's that? that customer specific information stored uh, I'm not sure that I can speak to the exact storage issues to the extent that you take it it's not in Canada because you said earlier you didn't have any presence in Canada oh yes yeah, sorry I wasn't thinking of it geographically I was thinking you no, were I sort of suggesting technologically I'm not uh, an engineer I'm sorry no, I don't no. know <laughs> I was thinking uh, where 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 it was stored physically oh um, no I actually I it's probably um, in our uh, databases in the US I'm sorry, I, I really can't right. speak sort of technically to that issue. Okay. Well, it's not so much a technical issue as um, how do you deal with privacy concerns that may relate to that, that sort of issues? Very I mean, do you, carefully. Do you comply with Canadian uh, federal or provincial privacy rules? So we comply with all regulations that we are required to, tax policy, all of that. We are a law-abiding company. Um, if you have specific questions on particular... Is, is, is it your view that you're subject to PIPIDA, for instance? Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that particular law. I can't speak to that today. It's a Canadian federal privacy law, so if you don't know what it is and don't know the acronym, I take it you're not worrying too much about that particular uh, statute. So uh, I, I am, I am I'm not our, our privacy counsel, but I'm, I'm happy to come back to you with an answer. So you're not aware of, of you complying with Canadian privacy law with respect to viewer choices? I can assure you that we comply with all required regulations and we take privacy. Yeah, but when you say required regulation, you're a lawyer by training, so am I. You might be saying, therefore, because you're not subject to Canadian law, therefore you're complying with U.S. law, but you might yes. not be complying with Canadian law. That's my point. Understood. And, and all I'm saying is that we obviously comply with any regulation 
law that applies to us, and it may be the case that it doesn't apply to us, but I'm happy not as our privacy counsel um, to get back to you, but my understanding um, just based on our, our operations would be that that would not be the case. I think the broader point, however, is we take privacy seriously for a number of reasons. Um, one, we've had long conversations this morning about how competitively sensitive we think all of this data is. It is in our commercial interest mm -hmm. to ensure that that data is never released at all, and certainly uh, both to protect our subscribers, but also because it would be really bad if our competitors got information about what our members were watching because it would give them a competitive advantage over it. So we have both responsibility to our members and our own commercial and competitive interests that put a high, highest priority on ensure, ensuring that our consumers' data is protected. Understood, but I'm just trying to understand if I'm a Canadian citizen that's worried about my privacy rights uh, and through some situation, and I take the point you take it seriously, but uh, I'm sure Home Depot took it seriously as well, and there's always gaps and problems and, and things that occur. Um, if I were a Canadian citizen living in Canada, where do I exercise my privacy rights? Were we in a situation uh, where Netflix breached them? So. Um, my understanding, and I can provide you with our privacy policy, is that there are uh, there are measures outlined in that. I don't have that in front of me today. I'm happy to provide it to you, but I, I would I'm just not thinking so much about your policies as the legislative frameworks that exist in Canada, both federally and provincially. Uh, well, I, I believe that our privacy policy would both outline um, the mechanisms and the venues, but also as well uh, the applicable law that could be invoked to the extent that there was an issue. Again, I just reiterate that this is something that we take extraordinarily seriously, in part because our brand depends on it and our competitive edge depends on it. Right. Um, and I hope you'd add citizens' concerns in there, too. It's Certainly. not just a commercial issue. Obviously, but I, I think that's why I said our, our brand, meaning consumer trust, right. is a big uh, part of that. Would it be that. possible, then, for you to undertake to provide? Uh, I, I take the point that you may not be... I'm not our privacy counsel. I'm, I'm happy to... Um, to what Canadian uh, privacy laws uh, are so you believe you're subject to? I will be happy to get back to you with information about which privacy laws we are subject to, and Canada, I will also yeah. provide our privacy policy for you if it's helpful. You, you could certainly undertake to do that. Could you do that by the end of, uh, of the, uh, the day Monday as well? You've got a lot of homework so far. Um, yes, I, I, I'll be in touch if, we, if I need an extension on any of those deadlines. Um, it is a lot so far, but obviously we will strive to get information as quickly as we possibly can, and we want to be helpful in the proceeding. And I take it that shouldn't be put confidentially. Uh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, may I have a few Thank questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of questions that, I, that just came to me that I had forgotten about. One, you talked about your competitors. Um, who are your competitors? So we compete broadly for people's time, right? They could be sitting down watching a book. They could be watching uh, a movie. They could go into the movies. They could be watching Netflix. Um, when we think about our competitors, we think of sort of similarly situated entities. So um, especially with the advent of a number of new over-the-top streaming services here in Canada, mm -hmm. we definitely consider uh, those entities to be Netflix competitors. In fact, uh, I would argue that Netflix's entry into that market uh, actually spurred uh, some of the uh, incumbents to launch services, which I you know, think is great. And um, they, we may make, dis may make uh, decisions about where we want to go with programming that differentiate ourselves over time, but certainly we look to uh, over-the-top providers who are trying to, I think, give a more consumer-friendly, consumer focus. Um, we're a bit different entities. We're not an authenticated over-the-top model right. like some of these are, although I understand that there are some Canadian streaming services that 
that are not authenticated. So um, I think there's a lot of people experimenting with business models out there. I think it's an exciting time. It's a great time for innovation, and, and hopefully it keeps going and it keeps pushing us all to be better. Right. On the innovation front, and I'm not going to, you had some uh, choice words on the Canadian Broadcasting System in your intervention. I'm not going to go back. There are some um, <coughs> critiques. Um, some of the uh, strengths and weaknesses of the system and some of the failures and successes. You also had some comforting words for Canadian producers. Now, as we move forward, as you said, and the other streaming services and all kinds of other um, content-starved entities um, look for that um, golden piece of content being king, um, I'm going to give you a chance to sort of speak to some of the encouraging words you had for Canadian producers and the opportunities that um, are available and will be available to them today and going forward. Um, do you want to sort of reiterate some of that? Sure. In the new environment? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, um, I think we're moving forward into really positive territory. There are, these new technologies are creating new windows for licensing, new avenues for licensing. Um, it is expanding audiences outside of Canada. Um, and what it will mean is that as people are um, trying to make their service the best they can, Canadian content providers, I think, are going to have a lot more suitors. Um, and probably for some of, for, for content that is just, you know, knock you on your butt, awesome, you're going to have people that are just competing, which is going to result in, I think, more money paid to Canadian pro content providers. But additionally, I think um, the, the other side of this happy story, and I, I think that we try to do this at Netflix, is it doesn't have to be the big blockbuster. There's a lot of um, content that is more niche, that's more experimental. Uh, they may be able to find a home on Netflix. Uh, they may be able to find a home on another service that sort of differentiated itself to, um, uh, to kind of focus on some of that content. So, you know, a streaming service that is focused on anime, a streaming service that is focused on documentaries. There's a lot of different business models that our people are experimenting with here in Canada, outside of Canada. I think you're going to see a lot more um, exciting avenues as a content provider to find a home for really good content. And as long as it's really good, there's always going to be a market for it. Ergo, any shrinkage in any previous uh, platforms um, will grow many fold on other platforms. I think that was your message. I think that that's right. The I positive mean, part of your message, because there was some other, <laughs> some of the failures were, were quite clear as well. Well, it's certainly the positive part of my message. And I think um, the tendency when things change is to get worried and to look at the glass as half full. I don't think that that's the case. I think that as a content provider, it's helpful to look at the emergence of online media um, as not a glass half empty or even a glass half full, but like a whole other glass. So um, because there are all these a other... Picture. A pitcher, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I just think it's a really exciting time for content, and including content that might have typically had a hard time finding a home. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, like many others in this hearing, uh, Ms. Wright, you've made cogent arguments, but we need evidence to support your allegations. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will, uh, I can just imagine what the journalists will do now, so why don't we take a break till 10.30. Thank you.